nurse. So that that's my interest in public health. So all things public health and all things nursing and kind of putting them together. So today we're going to discuss Spanish influenza and COVID-19 and these pandemics that we saw in the U.S. Um, and the public health response during these pandemics and what we've really learned uh, from history and also from what we're doing now. So by the end of our time today, my hope is that you will be able to describe what public health is and how it um, functions within the U.S., um, discuss the Spanish influenza epidemic in the U.S., and then kind of compare and contrast the public health response during Spanish flu influenza with that of COVID-19 in the U.S. Also, hopefully you'll be able to explain what the basics of contact tracing are as a key public health intervention to mitigate pandemic, um, and then also relate the social determinants to the social determinants of health to when we isolate and quarantine patients. So hopefully that's what we'll get through today and um, let's get started. Um, so about a hundred years ago, the US faced an influenza pandemic called Spanish influenza or the Spanish flu, and it killed approximately 675,000 people in the US. And it infected more than 500 uh, million and it killed more than 50 million people worldwide. So if we compare this to COVID-19, which we don't have quite as many months as what we look back and see with Spanish influenza, but it first appeared in the US um, in January, 2020, and the New York Times front page headlined just last Sunday that we our deaths neared 100,000. So I know just this week we've reached just beyond that 100,000 mark uh, of deaths in the US. So I chose to do a comparison of Spanish flu and COVID-19 to illustrate the importance of public health and the response that public health has during a time of pandemic and how this response is impacted by the ability of the workforce, by politics, by world events, and also the resources that we have available to us when a pandemic strikes. So first, let's just talk about the words endemic, epidemic, pandemic. You may have heard all three throughout this time. And I have a, a slide here just to show you. Um, so endemic is what we normally see. These are normal rates of disease, what we expect to see in a population. It becomes an epidemic when there is a spike in the rate of diseases and there's more than normal and an excess of normal of what we normally see. And a pandemic is usually the word used when the disease spreads across borders and usually into multiple countries or continents. So at the time of Spanish influenza in the US, we were entering into our first world war. So the US troops and all the travel they did abroad aided in promoting that transmission of the disease worldwide. So, Let's talk a little bit as we go forward about what the role is of public health. Um, and then we can discuss what public health response looks like and how they function in the US. So first of all, what is public health? We consider the health of the public, meaning that we measure health and illness in terms of a, of a population. So as a nurse, when I work with individuals, I look at like things like vital signs, blood pressure, pulse, temperature of individuals. But when I work with populations, I look at rates of disease um, and, and look at larger numbers that tell me what the health looks like of the overall population. So we discuss, for instance, the number of cases in a county or a state, um, just like if we talk about obesity rates or the rates of heart disease in an area, we're talking about those measures of illness in a population. And this is why our response has to be in the best interest of the public. Um, so we work on containment so that the disease isn't spread around. So this is one reason public health recommends we wear masks and stay in our homes and quarantine um, so that we can contain the disease and not spread it around. So what does public health do? Um, public health assures the conditions in which people can be healthy by promoting and protecting health. Um, so prevention is really the focus of public health. In healthcare, it's usually about when you get sick, you come to us and we help you. In public health, it is more about prevention. 
And so um, we prevent disease by educating the public on what the dangers are, for example, of smoking and how that can impact your health. Uh, we also um, talk about what vaccines are available, which, you know, we don't have one for COVID-19 at this point, but hopefully we will. Um, so the, that is the way we promote health and prevent disease um, in public health. Um, so to illustrate this a little better, I just want to share a slide here that shows the three core functions and 10 essential services of public health. And we've seen these all really in action during COVID-19. So when we look at assessment, public health right now is monitoring the number of cases in, in, in the world, in the country, in states, and even in counties and locally. Um, so we also diagnose by testing people, um, and we also uh, provide contact tracing to try to figure out who people that now are a case were in contact with when they got inf before they got infected or when they were infected. If we move to policy development, this is what public does to public health does to inform and educate our leaders and the public about what we know about the disease. So during this time to this during this core function, we're also forming partnerships between agencies that can help us in our response. Um, and we develop policies or guidelines about isolation and quarantine, when it should start, how long it should be. Um, those kind of things are part of policy development. And then the last side is assurance. And this is when we actually enforce policies. And sometimes those policies become law and we have law enforcement help us with that at times. Um, it's also the area where we link people to the care that they need um, and we support our workforce and make sure they know how to respond and evaluate what we're doing to make sure it's actually working. Like you've heard a lot about flattening the curve. So those are the core functions and essential services of public health. So public health began in the US with two main functions, and this was in the 1800s. So their main functions, as you can imagine, were looking at health hazards of infectious disease and environmental or sanitation concerns. So that was mostly in the 1800s and the federal government eventually established the Marine Hospital Service, um, which was granted power to be able to start quarantining uh, in 1890. So the, main, the, the Marine Hospital Service eventually became the US Public Health Service in the early 1900s. So that's when they were beginning to develop state and local infrastructure. So that's, that infrastructure was still kind of forming and developing at the time that Spanish influenza began. And so now, 100 years later, our infrastructure has greatly improved um, and, we, and we need to, to respond to the spread of these infectious diseases, even these new diseases we haven't seen before now more than ever. So when Spanish influenza appeared in the U.S., and it was around here in the U.S. between January of 1918 and December of 1920, it was significant because it sickened or killed so many people in the U.S. and worldwide. And what was especially upsetting about it is that it sickened people or their mortality the death rates were higher in younger people, so people ages 20 to 40 years old. And these were the people that were part of the troops um, who were packed into military quarters and they were traveling abroad at the time. Um, so they were at high risk. Um, the first confirmed case of the US case of COVID-19 was in January 2020 in Washington state. And we know at, at this time that there's more than um, 1,678,000 confirmed cases in the U.S., meaning that they've had positive lab testing to confirm that it's COVID-19, and that there's been more than 100,000 deaths in the U.S. Now, if you recall, there was 675 people who died during Spanish influenza. So we're not experiencing a world war in the U.S. like we were then in 1918, but all of us have much more of a greater opportunity and ability to travel the globe whenever we want more than ever before, which of course helps spread disease around. And that's why you've heard about bans on travel. 
The other thing um, that's important to talk about when looking at then and now is communication. And one thing that public health understands that is vitally important during a pandemic is communication. So when we do contact tracing, which we'll talk more about, our communication with cases and their contacts really matters because we need to ask the right questions and we need them to give us the information we need so that we can prevent the disease from spreading further. We also have to be very careful we're respecting the privacy of people that are telling us who exactly they've been in contact with in the last couple of days. Um, so, and you know, we're using this information just to find out more and help us um, uh, contain the disease. So communication is also very important. The other part of communication that's very important is that we must have a coordinated response among federal, state, and local leaders. Um, and one of the issues during Spanish influenza was that there was no centralized message. Um, the president at that time called it the ordinary influenza, and it was far from ordinary because the symptoms were much more severe. And really, it, people were exposed and infected within 48 hours, so it was very difficult to contain. So with the government saying, this is just ordinary influenza, let's not make a big deal out of it, the trust was lost. Um, and the government was also focusing all of its energy and resources on the world war. So there was this, built into that was this infrastructure of optimism. And in fact, there were government censors that wouldn't let people print anything negative at all in the newspapers during that time. So again, one of the lessons we learned is that we need to tell the truth and we need to um, ensure that the public trusts us. That'll help with that. Um, we've also seen disconnect with COVID-19 between the current administration and the governors and the scientific experts at CDC and NIH. Um, so that's been a concern as well. And like I said, with media, all they really had in 1918 was newspapers and they were not all that reliable or factual. And again, they couldn't print anything that would damage morale at all. So now we probably have lesser people that look at newspaper or printed media. They look at social media. We didn't have that before. And social media, we know, can be full of lots of rumors or misinformation. And it's hard to know what's fact versus rumors or misinformation. So in considering all of the public health actions of promoting and protecting health of the public, what have we learned since 1918? Well, one thing we learned, probably the single most important lesson we learned, that in 1918, containment of the disease really failed. Um, they closed schools and bars and restaurants and churches, but they really didn't close businesses. So all of their efforts were a little too much too late or too little too late. Um, with COVID-19, we've implemented social distancing and isolation if you're a case and quarantine if you've had contact with the case. Uh, but like I said, the hard part of this with the Spanish flu, there was only a 48 hour incubation period with COVID-19, we have five or six days on average. So we have a very short window of opportunity to identify that this is what it is or that a person has symptoms to test them, to diagnose them, and then to get them isolated before they're around other people. And that's what's tricky. So we know containment measures to stop the spread of disease are absolutely necessary and they do, it does save lives. So one way that we do containment um, is through contact tracing. And you may have seen there's a lot of effort right now into getting the, even the public trained to do contact tracing um, so that we can help slow the spread of the disease. So when we do contact tracing, um, there's really six steps involved in contact tracing. Um, First, you know, we're kind of cold calling people we don't know and they don't know us and there could be some concern like, why are you calling me? Who are you? So we spend some time introducing ourselves um, and getting their basic info. So we know for sure we're talking to the case who's been diagnosed and, and we ensure their privacy. 
Um, next, we have to figure out their likely infectious period. Um, and we need to know that so we can tell them how long they can isolate. So we tell people to isolate for the duration of their infectious period, which is usually two or two days before they start to have symptoms till 10 days after their, at least 10 days after their symptoms begin. So all in all, it looks like about two weeks. Um, we and identify contacts then, and we make sure we um, ask the case who they've been in contact with. Sometimes we have to get them to look back at their cell phone or their calendar because they don't remember who they've been in contact with even the last couple of days. Then we instruct them to isolate um, and we provide isolation instructions to them. We also identify at this time some of the challenges that this person um, may have um, and provide support to them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. It can be a very challenging time for many people. Um, we also then will initiate contact tracing and that's when we call all the contacts that the um, that, that the case has provided to us to inform them that they've been exposed. We can't tell them when and by who they've been exposed, but we can tell them that they've been exposed. And we talk to them about what symptoms to look for and give them quarantine instructions. So a contact typically will quarantine for 14 days since their last contact with someone that has been, and been tested as positive. So if I call a contact on May 13th and they tell me their last contact with the person um, with people was May 10th, so they should quarantine from May 10th to May 24th. If they live with the person who has infected them or they've been exposed to, then the quarantine is usually longer. And that presents its challenges too, because as you can imagine, if you live with someone, it's hard to isolate and quarantine yourself from that person. Um, so we have to really work with them to have a plan. The other last step that's very important is that through the isol isolation and quarantine period is we have to do regular check-ins with both, with both the case and the, and the contacts to make sure that we know how they're doing and if they're improving, because if a contact develops symptoms, then they now become a case. So we do all of this to prevent spreading of disease. And we know that usually one person can affect, infect at least two other people. So if that continues on, it's the ability to infect people can happen quickly. So what, contact tracing is absolutely necessary and it's effective, but it is challenging. Um, people may not recall all of their contacts. They may refuse to give us information. They may refuse to isolate. They may just tell us straight out, I'm not doing this. I'm not staying at home. I have to work. Um, they may not listen to what we're saying or provide the vital information that we need. So our, as contact tracers, we're, tra we're trained to listen, respect privacy, provide very accurate guidance on what exactly we want them to do based on science and follow up. The follow up is very important. There's quite a bit of talk right now about um, using apps for contact tracing, but the concern that public health has with that is that, is there appropriate follow up when you're using an app? And we need to be able to connect with people to make sure that they really are isolating or they're staying in quarantine and provide support as needed and that we're tracking symptoms as well. So lastly, let's talk a little bit about what public health is often talking about, which are the social determinants of health. And what do I mean by the social determinants of health? Well, this is a slide from CDC. Um, these are the non-clinical factors that can cause or contribute to disease. So for example, housing or lack of housing or poor housing, um, economic issues, uh, educational issues, unemployment, all these things that can make it difficult for people, especially if we're asking them to isolate or quarantine. If people have these challenges, then it, these things tend to be amplified or, or stronger when, they're, um, when there's a disease or some kind of a disaster. So we know when we do contact tracing, it's very likely that we'll encounter some of these social determinants of health and we can't discount them. 
um, people's housing or living conditions, the financial needs of people, their food security needs. Um, they're very difficult and, and like I said, worsen for people often during a pandemic or a disaster. So we don't talk enough about social determinants of health when we are in a healthcare setting. We're concerned about that acute need, that acute health need, um, but we need to really consider the social determinants of health and all of these things that can affect people's ability to get ill and recover from illness. So I just wanted to make sure we mention those. And that's an important part of doing the follow-up with people that are, that are infected with COVID-19. So let's just conclude a on talking a little bit more about history again. And in what ways did history repeat itself? When we look back at Spanish influenza and now look to what we're dealing with right now with COVID-19. Well, we know that infectious disease spread is still a, a, um, a problem, is a concern and public health is needed to help with the containment of the, that infectious disease spread. Um, and that's kind of here to stay. Um, 100 years ago, the public health infrastructure was just forming. And 100 years later, cuts in funding for public health continues to damage the infrastructure that we've really worked hard to build up and have in place. Um, We've learned that honest and factual information and timely communication is vital to containing um, these infectious diseases and keeping it from spreading um, and ensuring the public's trust in what we're saying. Um, we know that some of the ways our leaders have recently communicated with the public has damaged that trust, so that's vitally important. Um, the public health response from 1918 to 2020 is, is very similar. Uh, containment, we, we work to contain the disease. And now, thankfully, we have more science that can guide us in what to do. And finally, the severity of a, pand a pandemic is not only about the illness or the death rates, even though you hear a lot about that, but it involves the circumstances that surround, um, the surround all of us as a nation. So the relationship of the people with their government the relationship between public health and healthcare, um, and how both are funded and how able they are to protect their workforce, um, the economics of our country, um, our media communication, and the research available to us because we know research provides us with new knowledge and leads to the development in this case of and the production of a vaccine. Also, whether we are at war or P, or at, at, during peace times, all of these things are part of the mix um, when we have when we're faced with a pandemic, and so all of these things will impact our response as public health and also as citizens during a pandemic. So I'll just end with this slide and say thank you for being with me today, and see if you have any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. We do have a few questions in the chat. So okay. the first is what percentage of people spreading the virus are asymptomatic? Also, do you think m that most areas have opened up way too soon? <laughs> Good question. I'm asking the same thing uh, and kind of waiting to see. Um, I don't, I can't quote an exact percentage like I'd have, to, I'd have to check on that, of how many people infect other people. The issue with this disease, um, so it's better than when you only have 48 hours till all of a sudden you know, you're, you're exposed to somebody with Spanish influenza and then 48 hours later you're, you're infected. Um, it could be two to five days, so there's a lot of people that don't have any symptoms or don't know at that time that they have COVID-19. So they could be out and working and shopping and at the beach and, and infect people and not know it. So I think there's probably more than we realize. And that's the whole idea of, you know, trying to social distance. That's why that's very important. Um, as for the second question, um, I think we're seeing from other places that have already opened that um, 
there has been some increase in disease spread. I've seen pictures that are, to me as a public health person and as a nurse are very scary, like people crowded in pools and Lake of the Ozarks. I saw that from over the weekend, you know, Memorial Day weekend, people on the beaches. I think there will, we will see an increase in some cases because people are either just not following the guidelines or maybe it's hard, it's, it's hard to say if it's too early um, because and I know in our area, you know, on the Eastern seaboard and in the mid Atlantic area, there's still a lot of new cases every day. So there's that constant struggle of, we want to reopen the economy and we want to reopen the state or the community, but we are still seeing those increases in cases each day. So hopefully yeah. that answers. Another question is regarding who manages contact tracing. Is it a government agency or another office that does so? It usually is managed by local public health and sometimes they'll work together with the local health system. So, you know, I live in Frederick County and Frederick County, is, the Frederick County government. So public health is local public health is a government entity and they have um, a team of people doing contact tracing and they are looking actually for volunteers to be trained and provided as well. So there, that local health department is managing that. And thank you for those questions. Do we have any additional questions? And again, please feel free to unmute yourself and you can ask verbally or you can type them into the chat as the other questions were and I can read them out. I, this is Johanna again. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Cooper, for presenting. Um, sure. For the Spanish flu, what eventually, how did it end, eventually end or burn out? And do you see something similar with COVID? Um, what do yeah. you see the trajectory is? That's that's a great question. And I think it, as, as fast as it came and violently spread, it seemed to like at least what they what what I have read to kind of just disappear. I mean, it was here for, you know, 18 months or two close to two years. But um, I think as it travels through and it's spread around that it eventually kind of loses its strength. And, you know, the the cells that are the virus as it the virus just weakens after time. So I think that's kind of what we may see here, it, it all just depends on um, the strength of it, the virus and its ability to reproduce. And I think we're still learning a lot about that, that it is COVID-19 is a, a, I think it's a COVID-2 SARS virus. And we're still learning about what that life cycle looks like. Um, and so a lot of it is based on science and how long it can live and how well it can reproduce. Um, but a lot of it is also based on how well the nation puts this response into place, quarantines and isolates people and, um, and, and handles that. Because we, it, it, is, it, does, it does really make a difference to keep people at home and socially distanced and that type of thing. I mean, the virus needs a host, we're the host. Right, that's exactly, <laughs> exactly. So the less we can travel around and be in contact, close contact with people, um, hopefully the shorter time frame we'll see. <laughs> um, do you need any specialized training to be a contact tracer? Most health departments that I'm aware of are interested in having people have, especially if they're not, you know, healthcare or public health people to have some training. And it is good because I'll, I'll recommend too, the Association of State and Ter Territorial Health Officials, which is ASTO, A-S-T-H-O. They um, are the trade association that supports the state public health departments. So every state has a public health department. They have a very good contract, contact tracing course you can take online, as does uh, Johns Hopkins. So the Johns Hopkins one, if anyone wants me to connect them because I've seen, I saw this on Twitter and on social media, I can connect you to it. But that's a very good course. And I think 
even as a public health person, I was, when this first started, I was like, oh, contact tracing, right. Because I haven't really done that in forever. And, and that's what we don't hear about. We hear about people on the front lines and that's what we should hear about. They're working with the sick people, but the behind the scenes people are public health. And, um, and we have to make sure that they're ready um, to do the contact tracing as well. So those two courses are very good. Um, I forget how long it took me. But there's a couple modules you go through of videos and some online quizzes you can take, but it, it tells you a little bit about COVID-19, what we know about COVID-19, how to communicate with people, what to do if people say, I'm not going to isolate or I'm not going to quarantine or, um, or they get upset. So it does help you think through some of those scenarios when you're calling people that way. So I, I recommend the training, even to, especially if it's something you're not familiar with. And most public health agencies, I'm sure, would recommend a little something so that you're up to speed on what exactly you need to do. The public health agencies have guidelines, too, of what they would expect you to do as a contact tracer. We have a comment that um, some say there's underreporting because people are dying at home without being tested, and others say that there is overreporting because of an exaggeration due to politics. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard both too, and I think that's one of the challenges um, of public health is trying to get people to report and report honestly. It's kind of like the census, right? That <laughs> you want people to, to take the census survey and get the information that we need, but not everybody's gonna do it um, or do it or report accurately. So um, yeah, I've, I've heard that too. Um, so that it, I think the numbers that we have are the best we can do to try to paint a picture of what's happening and how the disease is spreading um, in the US. I think one thing that this illustrates too is how connected something like this is to politics um, and how uh, I even heard someone told me this morning because I'm from, I'm not from Maryland, but I don't want to throw any other state under the bus. <laughs> but someone told me, I heard in the state where you're from that somebody in the House of Delegates was, was sick and they told their party that they were sick, but they refused to tell the other party. But the problem was they were all in the same room together in session. So for instance, you know, maybe the Democrats, somebody was sick and they didn't tell the Republican side. And it's like, that's the crazy stuff. It's like, we have to use our head <laughs> and we have to work together and try to protect each other and be honest. Um, and I don't know why that person chose to do that, but, um, I know that there was people with chronic conditions saying, if I would have known, I could have better protected myself. And so <laughs> politics are, are always in the mix. <laughs> and I wanna thank everyone who typed questions into the chat or um, spoke up and said them. Any final questions for Dr. Cooper before we would wrap up? Going once. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank you all for joining. Most importantly, I want to thank Dr. Cooper for giving this sure. wonderful presentation. This has been recorded and it will be posted on the website, hopefully early next week for you to go and view again or share with people. Um, we would highly encourage you to do that as well. Thank you and have a wonderful and safe weekend, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Have a great Thanks. weekend. Thanks, Peyton. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.